Hey everybody, welcome back to another video lecture. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to take a look at proteins. So we're going to we're going to look at just some general functions of proteins. We're going to look at amino acids, the building blocks. We're going to look at some of their properties, some of the react or the reaction that actually uh, forms the uh, the protein itself. We're going to look at classification um, of the different types of structure, protein structure. And then we'll talk about um, denaturation, how proteins actually can unfold. So let's just start by looking at um, some of the different classifications for proteins. Okay, so proteins have a lot of functions in our bodies. They can be structural. So think of your hair, think of your skin, your bone. Um, these contain proteins that are there. Um, these are usually insoluble, water insoluble proteins um, that add um, rigidity to the cell and to um, our, our bodies in general. So collagen is one of these structural molecules. We'll look at um, one of the structures, uh, the structure of collagen in a little bit. And uh, we'll also look at keratin, or we'll, we'll talk about keratin. Uh, again, keratin is the main component um, of your hair and nails. Um, if you look at other animals, keratin often makes up their horns, these kind of things. Uh, proteins can be catalysts. Uh, enzymes are what you should think of. Uh, and we, we talked about how catalysts can make reactions go faster. Well, enzymes are proteins that catalyze reactions. And um, again, we find this in all living systems, virtually all living systems, and virtually all of the reactions in those living systems are made faster by enzymes. Um, movement, this is uh, a, a, re a reference to muscles. So um, any kind of motion that uh, a cell or that um, organisms can do um, is because of these proteins. Um, the ones responsible for our muscle action is uh, myosin and actin. They can be transport. Hemoglobin is a good example of that. It transports oxygen. Um, we looked at, in the last chapter, the lipid membrane, right? The phospholipid bilayer. And we saw that there was transport proteins, proteins that are actually embedded in the, in the cell membrane um, that allow uh, passive diffusion, right? Or, I'm sorry, facilitated diffusion. They, they have little ion channels so that things, molecules, ions, sugar, what have you, can move in and out of the cell. And so there are proteins that do that job. Um, some proteins act as hormones. So we're going to see here that insulin, oxytocin, um, and human growth hormone are examples. But um, we saw in the last chapter lipids, um, some steroid hormones. So in this one, we're just going to kind of contrast that with some protein hormones. Um, they can be protect, uh, protection, offer protection. Um, and this comes in a, f a couple varieties. Um, your book talks about blood clotting. And so protein um, are involved in, in keeping us from bleeding out. Um, at the same time, we have an immune system that uses proteins to make antibodies. And antibodies are those um, kind of first line of defense um, against foreign invaders inside our bodies. They go and they, they latch on to the outside of, you know, what have you, a bacteria, a virus, and uh, lets our bodies kind of coordinate an effort against them. They can be for storage. Um, we have proteins that store um, iron, for example. We have ferritin in our bodies that stores iron for us. But they can also be um, just ways of storing protein. So, for example, milk um, has a store of protein in it um, in the form of casein. Eggs have their protein stored as ovalbumin. Um, and this, and, you know, in the case of milk and in the case of ovalbumin, um, this is usually for their, their offspring to supply them with some good nutrients. But... Um, again, it can be stored as a molecule. It can also be involved in storing um, regulation. Proteins can control expressions of genes. We haven't gone into transcription yet, um, and, and it's different for prokaryotes versus us, which are eukaryotes. Um, but we have transcription factors, which are essentially proteins that dictate which parts of our DNA get transcribed or turned into um, you know, expressed as, as proteins, um, and which ones don't. Um, and so a lot of the regulation over which parts of our DNA are actually being transcoded um, is done by proteins. We can divide proteins into two general classes. We can say that they are fibrous proteins, and we can say that they are globular proteins. 
fibrous proteins, for the most part, are insoluble. Globular proteins we tend to see are soluble. And when we start to look at um, some of the features of, a, of the amino acids specifically, we can then come back to these two terms and kind of relate to why globulars tend to be soluble and why fibers tend not to be. Okay, let's look at, let's look at some amino acids. So first, generally, let's find the structure of amino acid. So um, the amino acid is, uh, your book refers to... Um, in a few different ways, so I'll just draw the way that I usually show them and then we can refer to the book as well. So I'll draw you an amino acid here. And the backbone of our amino acids is going to be NCC. NCC, 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 over and over. Every amino acid will have this NCC. Now it's an acid because it has a carboxyl group on it. And it's an amino acid because this carbon right here, which is called the alpha carbon, um, has the amino group on it. So remember, the alpha carbon is the carbon adjacent to the carbonyl carbon. And so this alpha carbon has this nitrogen on it. So we know that that's an amine group. And so these are amino acids. They have the amine, they've got the acid. So what this molecule also has, I'm going to move my my alpha symbol. So it's got an R group, and this R group is going to vary from amino acid to amino acid, and then it has an H on it. And so one of the other things we'll notice is that this carbon, this alpha carbon, is chiral. You'll remember that from our chapter on chirality. So it's got four different groups on it, and with the exception of one amino acid, which we'll see in a second, uh, most, uh, all of our amino acids, um, this, this alpha carbon is, is the chiral center, or the chiral carbon, uh, the stereocenter. Um, okay, let's talk about um, Zwitter ion, because that term's up here. So we know, unfortunately, these groups, the amino group and the carboxyl group, they are very susceptible to pH, or changes in pH, and, and we also know that they ionize in water. And so we, we know that each of these is going to have um, a reaction where it's going to possibly have an ionized form. Oops, I'm sorry. Oh, man. Sorry. Okay, back to where we were. Each of these will have an ionized form. And so we're we, we don't ever have an unionized form. On paper, that's something we can draw. But in real life, these things ionize. And they will either be charged uh, individually, where this one will have a charge, or this group will have a charge, and in some cases even the R group, um, or we'll talk about them as their Zwitter ion. And so Zwitter ion is the form where they don't have a net charge. Um, so let's draw the Zwitter ion form on this molecule that I've drawn for you. So kind of, let me clean up some of this. Okay, so let's make this into the Zwitter ion. And the nitrogen is going to get protonated, right? We know that these amines are basic, and so they take protons, and they, um, the, their lone pair electrons will go, and they'll grab a proton. Um, that's going to make them positively charged. And we'll see this um, at low pHs and at physiological pH, but anything higher than you know, usually around 7, and we'll look specifically at um, their Ks and Kbs a little later, PKs and PKBs, if we really want to know when it's going to uh, lose that H. Uh, but for the most part, at low pH and at physiological pH, these um, amines are, are protonated, so they're the ammonium salts. Um, and our carboxyl groups are also going to be susceptible to ionization. They might lose their H. So actually, I need, to, I need to erase that. So these can actually lose their... Oh man, that's going to be annoying. They can lose their hydrogen and be negative charged. Now again, the R groups, if they have amines or carboxyl groups on them, um, may possibly become charged at different pHs. But at physiological pH, our carboxyl group is going to have a negative charge. Our amino group is going to have a positive charge. And since these charges offset, 
this is what we would call a, an, an uncharged um, or a no net charge amino acid or a zwitter ion. Okay, so zwitter ion is how we're going to refer to every amino acid from now on because they're, they're all in our bodies charged in this way. Okay, we talked a little bit about the fact that that alpha carbon is the chiral center. So just to kind of show you using a Fischer projection, um, the way that we decide if this amino acid is going to be L or D is going to depend on what side um, this amino group is on. And I'll show you a picture of a sugar here in a second so you can compare that to how we did this with the sugars. Let's just say um, our bodies tend to have L amino acids. In fact, most life contains only L amino acids. D amino acids are very rare uh, in nature. They do show up in bacterial cell walls and you know some obscure bacteria, um, but for the most part, our bodies um, like the L version. Here is that um, comparison. I was trying to erase this. Sorry. Um, with a sugar. So here's the comparison with a sugar. And so if you remember when we looked at sugars. We said the last or the, the furthest, yeah, the last, the last stereo center from the most oxidized carbon. So that would be this guy right here. Um, we look at the position of the hydroxyl group. If it's on the left, we say it's L. If it's on the right, we say it's D. And so you can see that here. Um, the D amino acid has the amino group on the same side as the hydroxyl group in the D sugar. So that is um, how we decide L or D. And that should be kind of a, a refresher or a reminder from um, our carbohydrate chapter. Okay, so let's talk about amino acids. We've got 20 different amino acids that our bodies used, used to make protein. Um, and we can break these up into really three groups four groups if you if you are getting more specific. So here I'll tell you the three groups. The three groups are the nonpolar, the polar uncharged, and the polar charged. You can actually make four groups if we say nonpolar, polar, um, acidic and basic, right? Acidic and basic are actually the polar charged, but you'll see that in a second. So in our nonpolar group, the first of the three or the first of the four. Um, we've got nine amino acids. And the only difference in these is, again, that R group. And what's not uh, explicitly shown here, though you guys remember there are H's here, but I'll draw it so you can see it. Uh, glycine is the only one that the R group is an H. It's just a hydrogen. This is also the only one that is um, that the alpha carbon is not chiral. And you remember... That's because it has two hydrogens on it. Okay. Um, for the most part, all of these amino acids, even the ones I haven't shown you yet, are primary amino acids. Um, proline, though, is a secondary amine. Um, the main characteristic here is that these have nonpolar R groups. So um, all of the things in red that you see here, these are, for the most part, nonpolar, and uh, we'll come back and talk about some of these uh, some of these aromatic features in a couple of minutes. So let's go on to the polar amino. Oh, while we're on this topic, also, each of the amino acids comes with a three-letter code and a single-digit code. Um, this makes it much easier when we're writing out long sequences of uh, amino acids. Uh, familiarize yourself with the names. Um, familiarize yourselves with the three-letter codes. Notice that some of them don't match up. Tryptophan, for example, has a W, right? Phenylalanine has an F. Um, some of them make perfect sense. Some of them don't match up. So just uh, be aware of that. Here are our polar side chain amino acids. Um, and again, these, the R groups, have something polar in them. So um, here we've got a thiol group. Here you've got some hydroxyl groups. Um, here we've got a hydroxyl on a benzene. Remember, this is our phenol group. This guy can be acidic. 
though it is not grouped um, with the acidic amino acids. Um, but but this, this hydrogen, though, is still acidic um, and does still come off. Um, and then we've got some amino, um, some amide groups. So these both right here are amides. And again, they're polar because they've got these carbonyls. They've got these hydrogen bonding um, OHs. Um, so these are our, our polar groups. And then the last of them are the acidic and the basic. These are the polar charged. And so if we just kind of jump back real, real quick here, you see that all of our polar groups don't have any, any um, ions on them, no, no charge symbols. Uh, but if we come in here to the acidic and the basic side chains, um, you'll see those charges. Now histidine um, can be charged. It's not shown uh, charged at the moment. I think that's because that's the nitrogen here that I'm not sure, actually. I'll have to check that and come back to you. One of these two nitrogens is the basic one. I think it's that one, um, the one that I drew the little lone pairs on. But um, OK, so uh, let's talk about why these are called acidic and why these are called basic. So these guys here, um, and actually the names shown don't match what's being drawn here. Aspartic acid is this molecule actually with an H on it. And when it doesn't have the H and it has that negative charge, this is called aspartate. And glutamic acid, again, is the one with the H on it. But at physiological pH, uh, at 7 you know, pH, these H's have fallen off. And so there aren't, they aren't there. And this is glutamate. So you'll see the word glutamate and aspartate. Um, don't confuse those with something else. Aspartic acid and aspartate are various forms of the same amino acid. Um, but those are the acidic ones because they have those hydrogens that they can lose. Um, it, these are the basic, these three here, arginine, histidine, and lysine. And again, they're basic because they can gain um, hydrogens. They're already shown having gained some hydrogens. Um, um, yeah, histidine um, has a pKb of 6.8 eight or something like that. So at pH of seven, this guy right here is missing its H. It should be shown here. Um, and this should have a positive charge. So my graphic was not, um, was not showing you where that charge would go. So there it is. So these are the basic amino acids and the acidic amino acids. As I mentioned, for 19 of the 20, uh, basically glycine, the, the one um, that isn't counted here. Um, oh, I'm sorry. 19 of the 20 are have the alpha carbon that is a stereocenter. Um, and 19 of the 20 are also primary, with the exception of proline. Proline is secondary. So this is actually kind of telling us. So 1 out of 20 uh, is the exception, and 19 out of 20. Anyways, um, we also actually have two amino acids that have another stereocenter, um, and that would be isoleucine and threonine, and this happens in the R group. Um, and so I'll leave it for you to pause this video and to look at these structures here. So remember, this is the uh, NCC. Here's our hydrogen, and so everything over here is the R group. And then same thing here. We have... NCC, there's our hydrogen, and then everything that way is the R group. See if you can find, well, that's the stereo center in this one. See if you can find the stereo center in the, um, the isoleucine. So I already started talking about this. Um, we know uh, from past chapters on carboxylic acids and on, on amines, um, about the ionization of those two groups. And so, again, as pH changes, um, we're going to see changes to those two groups. And so I'd like to draw a molecule for us here. Maybe let's take, um, let's take aspartic acid and actually show those changes as pH changes. So uh, I, I know the book is going to probably show us that too um, in one of these slides, but I just wanted to draw one for us. So I'm going to draw aspartic acid. So I'm going to go N... C, C, and here we've got our H. This is going to have our NH3 
with a plus charge. And, and I'm going to start at low pH. So low pH, like, you know, pH of 1 or something like that. Now our R group for aspartic acid is a CH2 and a COOH. And so at low pH, there's everything is protonated. The amine has acted like a base, gained a hydrogen, and has a plus charge. The um, carboxyl, uh, carboxylic acid group has an H on it. And the one in our R group also has an H on it, so there are no charges there. So now let's say we start to change the pH. So let's add some sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide will raise the pH of this solution. So let's just take it from one to let's say seven, somewhere right in the middle. Um, and so at that point, we're gonna lose our H's on our uh, carboxylic uh, functional groups. So these are going to have lost their hydrogens, our nitrogen though will not have lost its hydrogen yet, and most of our carboxyl groups will lose their hydrogens um, around pH 2 to 4, somewhere in that range 2 to 4, they'll lose all their hydrogen. So above 4, we're not going to see any of those um, protonated carboxyl groups. Um, on the other hand, the, um, this nitrogen here um, in the backbone, this NH3, this one typically isn't going to lose its um, hydrogen until we get into some high pHs, kind of around 8 or 9. Um, and we see that also with uh, nitrogens in the, in the R groups. So I'm not drawing an example of one that's basic. I'm drawing an acidic, base, uh, an acidic, acidic example. But in a basic example, we would just have another um, amino group in place of the, um, the carboxyl group that we have down there. Okay, so this thing at pH of let's say seven actually has a net charge of minus one, right? Minus one net charge because we've got two negatives and a positive. Now this wouldn't be the Zwitter ion. The Zwitter ion would probably happen over here somewhere somewhere in the middle, uh, maybe more around pH of 5 or pH of 6, where we wouldn't have lost um, that second hydrogen on the R group. And actually, we can look up at the, the specific PI, and we'll do that. We'll look at that um, for, um, what is this? This is um, aspartic acid. Let me see. Aspartic acid has a PI of actually 2.77. So for aspartic acid, um, when this has its hydrogen still and no net charge here, that's at pH, what did I say, 2.55? 2.77. So at 2.77, this hasn't lost its, o its H. At pH of 7, this H is gone. Okay? And again, every... Uh, amino acid is going to have um, an isoelectric point where it is a Zwitter ion um, at different pHs. Aspartic acid just happens to have a really low isoelectric point. But I'll show you a table in a second. And then for our last change here, let's go to pH 10. And this is going to have an NCC. Our carboxyl group has a charge on it. Our R group, oops, has a charge on it, and our nitrogen will have lost its extra proton and also lost its charge. And so what we can also say about amino acids going through this pH transition, that at low pHs, they're going to be positively charged, like we see in this example here, where the net charge is just plus one and there's nothing else on it. And then at high pHs, it's going to be negative. Like we see here, where there's just two 
negative charges and no positive charges. So all amino acids will either be positively charged at low pH, negatively charged at high pH, or zwitter ions somewhere in the middle. And this is important because these charges are going to affect the folding of the protein. And that means the right charges, the right folding, the wrong charges, the wrong folding, or no folding. And so that becomes important. All right, and so um, this is just kind of walking through those differences. So let me back up here. Um, the actual example that's being shown here, let me clean this up for you. Well, that didn't clean anything up. So let's clean all this up. So this reaction that you're looking at um, in black is actually just showing how the carboxyl group is affected by changes in pH. And in this case, we're just adding acid. And so um, you can see the only thing changing in this example is that we're going to gain our hydrogen and lose that negative charge. We can add strong bases to sodium uh, to this um, amino group uh, or to this amino acid, sorry, as well. And we can see that a different change will happen. This one's actually going to pull a hydrogen off of the amino um, and remove that charge. And so, again, this is just showing. Add acid. Uh, this is the add acid direction. Add acid, we're going to end up going to positive charges. Add base, we're going to end up going to negative charges. Here is the isoelectric points for those different amino acids. And again, at the isoelectric point, the charges are all balanced. There's never a point when the amino acids don't have charges. There's always going to be at least one charge on there. Um, in some cases, two charges, if you're acidic or basic. But this, is, this isoelectric point is when those charges cancel out. And you can see here, they happen mostly between 5 and 6. Um, the acidics are much lower. The basics are a little higher. Let's talk about some of the features of um, some of the amino acids um, that do, you know, uh, that are that are physiologically important. So cysteine is one of the physio physiologically important amino acids because um, it can form these covalent bonds. It can actually form uh, a dimer um, in in solution. But in, when it's built into a chain, built into a, a protein, we're going to see that these little disulfide bridges or disulfide bonds that we can form between cysteines is actually going to be pretty important. Um, so cysteines uh, form these um, from the sulfur, um, the, the thiol groups form these disulfide bonds. Um, and we can actually, uh, I'll give you an example. In your hair, you have uh, keratin, which is the, the, the protein that makes up your hair. Um, you have cysteines, uh, you have lots of cysteines if you have curly hair. And those cysteines are forming disulfide bridges, which is why you have curly hair. When you want to go and straighten your hair, then we chemically break those bonds. We reduce that. Um, we reduce that disulfide bond back into that thiol form. Um, and then you lose those interconnections between cysteines, which makes your hair straight. Um, so, so just kind of uh, one example of how these disulfide bonds are important. Um, just as far as ha your hair is concerned, we'll see um, that actually dis disulfide bonds are important for um, various other proteins as well and keeping their structures, um, keeping their, their shape, their folded shape um, together. Uh, phenylalanine, tryptophan, and tyrosine. Um, these are important for a few reasons. I mean, one, just kind of right off the top, they're aromatic. So they have these, um, these um, conjugated ring systems. Um, these absorb light of particular frequencies. And so when we're trying to track proteins or find them, um, these particular residues or these amino acids are really useful for that because they will absorb light um, in like the 200 nanometer um, sort of um, uh, uh, range. They're also important um, because they're, they're precursors to neurotransmitters. Um, well, some of them are. This, these are important for serotonin. We'll see in, a, in another... Um, uh, in another slide, some of the other amino acids that form um, neurotransmitters um, as well, or, or hormones. So this tryptophan here um, gets oxidized into 5-hydroxytryptophan, which is decarboxylated into serotonin. Serotonin is involved in um, 
uh, relaxation. Some people think it has to do with um, with sleep. Um, it, it regulates sleep and, and your mood. Um, there is a connection between serotonin and depression. Um, what else did I want to say about serotonin? Um, low levels of serotonin are associated with depression. I said that. Um, oh, high levels of serotonin. These can be associated with like a manic state. Um, so manic depressive, man, manic depressive schizophrenia um, is actually managed by controlling the level of serotonin and its, um, uh, its metabolites. What do we got next? Phenylalanine and tyrosine. These guys, um, actually, so phenylalanine is a precursor to tyrosine. Tyrosine is a precursor to L-DOPA. L-DOPA is a precursor to dopamine, which is um, a really important neurotransmitter in our brains. It's involved in a lot of learning. It's involved in um, the, um, the reward system of our brain. Um, and then that gets um, converted into epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are involved in our fight or flight um, uh, responses. Um, and again, these, these are very important um, these are very important neurotransmitters. Um, so let's talk real quick about the difference between essential and non-essential uh, amino acids. There are some amino acids that we can make ourselves out of like glucose. Um, there are other amino acids that we cannot make ourselves. And so the ones we can't make ourselves and that we have to get from our diet, those are the essential amino acids. Um, a lot of the ones that are essential are essential not only because we can't make them ourselves, but because we need them for things like this to turn into neurotransmitters, okay? Um, dopamine, low levels of dopamine are associated with um, um, Parkinson's disease. Um, usually a treatment for Parkinson's is to, to give an L-dopa, uh, L-DOPA supplement. Um, you could try to give phenylalanine and tyrosine as well. Um, L-DOPA is generally given though because it passes the blood-brain barrier faster. Um, and so it, it's, it can go into those places and then get converted into dopamine, um, without having to start at the phenylalanine stage and, you know, convert it into tyrosine. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's, uh, the importance of these amino acids. There are other amino acids that, um, our bodies will end up having after modification. So like proline can be, um, uh, hydroxylated into hydroxyproline. We see hydroxyproline a lot. Um, hydroxylysine, um, thyroxine, which is a hydroxylated tyrosine. Um, I'm sorry, uh, that's that's not true. That one is iodine, iodated. This one has iodines on it. Um, but anyway, these are modified amino acids. Now these are these are what we call uncommon because they 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 aren't especially coded for. You'll see in our genetic um, code chapter when we start looking at how the information in DNA is turned into proteins that, that it actually codes for 20 amino acids. But more amino acids can be made by modification, post-modification. Uh, so hydroxylation is one of those. Methylation is another common one. Iodation, adding some iodines on here is also important. Um, while I'm talking about that... Um, yeah, okay. That's. I was going to say something else, but I'm going to save it for a different slide. All right. Peptide bonds. So this, this reaction that we're looking at here is not anything new. We have already seen a few reactions that, that make amides. We've looked at carboxylic acids reacting with amines. We also looked at anhydrides reacting with amines. Um, so the, 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 the amide bond that is forming here is what the peptide bond is. It's, it's been given a special name be, because they're amino acids. So these amino acids, because they make our peptides, which are our proteins, we're calling this special amide bond the peptide bond. Now, one of the features of the peptide bond that your book does go into, and you might remember, we talked about this a little bit. Um, sorry. That's irritating. Got to watch where I put my hand. Okay. One of the things that uh, we, if you might remember talking about is that there is no free rotation around this amide bond. This actually has some double bond nature, okay? Some double bond character. And so what we end up seeing is that this is a sort of a rigid 
plane. And we can think of um, all of our amino acids when they get linked together as being kind of like playing cards that are connected at the corners. And I know this isn't another amino acid shown here, but I wanted to draw my what I was saying. And so once we get some other peptide bonds, now there would be a peptide bond here and another peptide bond here. They're like, a, they're like playing cards connected at the corners, on opposite corners. And so that's going to actually play into a lot of the features we see uh, in our long peptides, in our, in our polypeptides. The, the, the fact that these, this part of the backbone in our uh, peptide bond, um, this part in particular, stays planar. Um, so then we're going to see that the way that we actually get some more um, variety in the folding and the, and the sort of structures we get is going to be due to those R groups, those, those um, differences per amino acid, right? That's going to bring in a lot of the variability. Um, so, so just real quick, uh, reminding you guys about that particular detail of the amide bond. Now, we already know the amide chemistry. Um, we're going to lose a water, right? We're gonna we're gonna form this peptide bond here, and we're gonna lose a water. Now peptides can be um, um, small; they can be big. So we have uh, dipeptides. This would just be two amino acids, and actually, with something like twenty different amino acids, you know, to pick from, there's quite a number of dipeptides we can make. I think your book actually says that there might be something like, um, let's see, what. What is 20, 2 to the 20? I think that's how you figure it out. Uh, all right, I don't have that information in front of me. Um, but it's something like 400, 400 different dipeptides that you can make, and then maybe there's something like 8,000 different tripeptides you can make simply by putting together right uh, different combinations of the 20 amino acids. So many, many, many types um, can be made. And we'll talk about how important you know which individual amino acid you actually have, um, how that how how important that is to the overall function and, and kind of structure of the uh, the final protein. Polypeptide is anything that um, uh, really has more than I don't know 20, 20 amino acids in it. Um, of course, they're all joined by peptide bonds, and then a protein, at least as we're going to define it, is a biological macromolecule that has at least 30 to 50 amino acids um, joined by peptide bonds. The amino acid units are often referred to as residues. Um, and so when we talk about, you know, the cysteine residue inside of, you know, um, insulin, that just means the amino acid system. Uh, okay, let's see. Here we go. I didn't even have to draw that picture. I should have just shown it to you. This is what I was talking about. All right, when we write peptides, by convention, we always show them from N, from the N side, right? NCC. I'll just do a few. There's a, a nice example on the next slide. Um, from the N side, which we call the N terminus, to the C side, which we call the C terminus. And of course, the N side is going to have that ionized amino group in this C terminus side. It's going to have a, here's the negative charge, an ionized carboxyl group. Um, but that's how we write them, from N to C, left to right. So here's an example of that. And so here you can see the amino acids. Um, NCC1, NCC2, NCC3, NCC4, NCC5, right? And then you can see each one would be different in their particular amino acid residues. And of course, we start with the N side and we go to the C side. So N terminal, C terminal refers to that. Now, we're not going to do any naming of peptides. But when you would name them, you would read them from N to C. Proteins can also be Zwitter ions. Proteins have electro isoelectric points. Proteins have lots of amino acids in them. Some of those amino acids are charged. 
If your protein has an equal number of positive and negative charges, then it's in its isoelectric point and it has no net charge. Above that pH, it's going to have a negative net charge. Below that pH, a negative positive charge, just like the amino acids individually. Um, your book talks about hemoglobin. It almost has an equal number of acids and basic uh, side chains, um, so an equal number of, of charges within, within, within its um, structure. Um, its pi is 6.8. So at 6.8, it would actually have an equal number of those charges. Um, serum albumin, another one, 4.9. Now the point of knowing the pi is actually useful when we're trying to separate proteins out um, for, for studying purposes, right? Um, when these things don't have a net charge, they tend to be less soluble in water and more uh, willing or more likely to aggregate together and clump up and precipitate out. And so we'll see that this is something that um, we can cause to happen intentionally when we denature protein. This can be something that happens as proteins move into different regions of the body uh, and experience changes in pH. Um, but again, like when well, I was mentioning, when we're trying to collect proteins, um, it's nice to be able to precipitate them easily at their isoelectric points. So we have a few different levels of structure in protein. We have primary, secondary, and tertiary, and these really refer to an individual protein chain. And then we have quaternary structure, which really refers to any protein that has more than uh, one peptide. Uh, so I would say, so more than one just means two or more, right? Two or more. And I think it even says that. It's interactions between subunits in a protein that has more than one polypeptide chain. So quaternary structure doesn't apply to every protein, but we will see that it applies to a lot of proteins. Um, so let's just go through each of these. Primary structure is the sequence of amino acids. It's just literally the number, I mean, the, the order of the amino acids from N to C. Here we go. This is where that information was hiding. So um, the number of different primary structures we can get just for dipeptides is, is large, right? 20 different amino acids to pick from, two positions, 400 different dipeptides. Tripeptides, 8,000. Um, polypeptides, I mean, it gets on and on. It gets bigger and bigger, right? Um, 20 to the N. So whatever number of pro amino acids you have in your peptide. Now, um, it says here small amino acids can have 60. Um, small, small proteins, sorry, can have as little as 60 amino acids in them. We're going to talk about uh, insulin um, here in a little bit. And insulin has, um, what does it have? It's got... I think your book actually I mean your um the slide's gonna tell me it's got 51 amino acids so I mean 51 right and 51 is actually for insulin it's got two chains so I think um, each chain actually has even less than that um, so they don't have to have very amino uh, very many amino acids to be functional in our bodies but a lot of them have hundreds if not thousands of amino acids in them um, so you can th you can imagine then just just the possibility for 60 amino acids leads to a number that's so large that it's probably a bigger number than there are even things in the universe. So the 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 opportunity to make a protein that does a particular job is probably um, you know endless. Different combinations, different tasks. Let's talk about how important that actual sequence is. So let's look at insulin. So this is actually bovine insulin. This is not your, your human insulin. A um, couple of things to, to note here. Um, it's got 30 amino acids in this chain. It's got 20 in this chain. I think I might be um, actually, I might be missing one if I didn't scroll down far enough. No, I think that's it. Um, this one actually has two chains in it. So you can see there is um, two N termini. They're not shown. And two C termini. Um, this is held together by two disulfide bridges that take place between these cysteines. And we also see that there's an intrachain cysteine disulfide bridge. So all three of these bonds are important. Um, let's look at some of the differences just in, in bovine insulin to like human insulin and a few other different types of insulin. 
So um, human insulin at positions 8, 9, and 10 has these amino acids, where the one we just looked at, looked at actually has a different amino acid in two of those positions, as well as in position 30 on chain B. So different amino acids, different organisms. Um, I do know this. Um, hemoglobin for cats, hemoglobin for us. Hemoglobin for cats has a lot less amino acids, but it does the same job. It carries oxygen in their blood. It wouldn't work in our bodies. We wouldn't be able to, to, to get oxygen from cat blood, and they wouldn't be able to get oxygen from our hemoglobin. And our hemoglobin is, is much bigger, and it does the same job. So different structures can do the same job in different organisms. Similar structures can do different jobs in, in different organisms. Um, the difference in the amino acid makes a huge difference. Um, uh, it can make a huge difference. It can also make no difference. And we'll see um, that there are sub substitutions that you can like swap out uh, an amino acid. For example, um, right here, this isoleucine and this valine, both of those are nonpolar amino acids. So whatever their importance is, um, it, it, it's that it's important that they're nonpolar. If we were to switch out in our bodies a nonpolar for a polar amino acid, that might mess up the whole thing. Um, I don't know if your book talks about um, sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is um, a problem with um, the hemoglobin in, in some people. They have one amino acid that is changed. One amino acid is different. And now their protein, their hemoglobin protein, doesn't hold the right shape. It forms this weird little um, sickle shape. The, the hemoglobin is all kind of packed together. Um, they aggregate in the in the blood cell. It leads to this lopsided blood cell that ends up having sharp edges and breaks easily. And they don't have a lot of blood and they don't have a lot of oxygen transport. Um, one amino acid. Let me show you something else. Um, this is um, vasopressin and oxytocin. These are nonapeptides, so they have um, nine or 19, I don't remember what nona means, uh, nine. They both have nine amino acids in them. We'll just show them to you. Uh, vasopressin is a diuretic, antidiuretic. Oxytocin is involved in muscle contractions, I think uh, during childbirth. They are basically the same structure, right? Uh, sorry, I don't want to use that term. They are basically the same shape. Notice the differences. At amino acid position two, so in their primary structure, reading from N to C, number two is a different amino acid, and number seven is a different amino acid. And these guys have different jobs. They both only have nine amino acids total. So again, just highlighting, primary structure is the order of the amino acids, and primary structure matters. We're going to see that there are um, other interactions that have to happen between amino acids, um, sometimes for the final folded protein. But in this case, it, it just looks like the actual difference in the amino acid leads to different physiological function. Okay, secondary structure. A secondary structure um, is how we tend to see these long polymers of amino acids organize themselves. So um, the two most common that we see are something called an alpha helix and a beta pleated sheet. So let's look at the alpha helix first. So an alpha helix is called so because it kind of forms this right-handed coil that looks like a helix, okay? It's held together by hydrogen bonds between amino acids. Now, they're not neighboring amino acids. One amino acid, let's see if I can find one, um, this guy right here, this amino acid, and it's nitrogen. Uh, where, wait, hold on. Uh, maybe I circled the wrong, yeah, I circled the wrong thing. Let me try this again can't really can't really make out on here so you can see the hydrogen bonds my problem is I'm looking for a, a white ball on a blue ball hydrogen bonding to a red ball and I'm not really seeing what I want to see um, in this particular drawing I guess I see it here so here's a here's a blue ball this is a nitrogen it's got a hydrogen that hydrogen is hydrogen bonding to this oxygen over here let's see how far away these guys are from each other so this nitrogen is on this amino acid, and that is one, let's see, two, three, 
four amino acids away from the one which I think is belonging to this oxygen. This might be just a bad drawing or a bad diagram to try to show this, but um, alpha helixes are stabilized by hydrogen bonding between the amino acids in this backbone um, that, that are sort of winding up like this. And um, what's notable is that the hydrogen bonds happen in the same direction as the helix, okay? And all the R groups are pointed outward. So none of the R groups are, are internal here. They're all sort of sticking out into the outside of this helix. Um, anything else about the alpha helix? Um... 3.6 amino acids per turn. Uh, six atoms of each peptide bond lie in the same plane. Let's see. Oh, here we go. This says it. The peptide, the CO group is bonded, uh, hydrogen bonded to the NH group of the peptide bond four amino acid units away. So I couldn't really show it in that diagram, but it's true. Here is an alpha helix of a polyalanine. So all of these are alanines. Um, all of the R groups are alanines. Um, and here we can kind of see those hydrogen bonding. Let's see, where's the other ones here? Hydrogen bonding happening between the nitrogens and the oxygens. The other, super second, uh, the other secondary structure that we see is something called a beta pleated sheet. These can happen uh, parallel or anti-parallel. What's being shown here is anti-parallel, where one strand is going down and the other strand is going up. Uh, but these can also be where the strands are heading in the same direction. Um, and that usually involves, let's see, some kind of, let's see, some kind of weird, you know, looping. Where hydrogen bonding can happen between these guys. Um, and so the key takeaway here is that in these alpha helix and beta sheets, the, the key force holding these super uh, these secondary structures together is hydrogen bonding. Um, with the ple pleated sheets, the hydrogen bonding actually takes place between the two sheets. So we get nitrogen, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, right? Hydrogen bonding. Um, and so this holds together this sort of zigzaggy um, structure. And so this is what we call secondary structures. Now, um, let's see. All of the R groups on one chain alternate, one above, then below the plane. So it's a little bit of a different organization than in the alpha helix. Um, the third sort of position or the, the structure that we see is something called a random coil, um, which is exactly what it sounds like, random. Uh, let's see. So this is a globular protein. Um, again, we don't have a lot of good images, fibrous versus globular. Um, the fibrous ones tend to be really long and straight. So this looks like a big glob, then it's globular. Um, what you see here are alpha helices. You see beta sheets. They're rep represented as arrows, like ribbon arrows, um, and then random coil. And so this is a typical picture of a protein that you would see in a book or online. Um, and that's what these, these structures represent. These are the alpha helices connected to the um, beta sheets by usually random coils connected to each other even by random coils. Okay. Here's collagen. Collagen is actually uh, what we call a super secondary structure. It's got, uh, it's what we call a triple helix. And it's actually, um, I can't spell helix. There we go. Um, it's actually just three alpha helices kind of wrapped around each other. Um, collagen makes up a lot of the uh, structural component of like our skin and stuff like that. Uh, what's true about collagen also is that it gets uh, it gets um, sort of uh, uh, 
denser as we get older. I want to say we have more collagen the older we get, which is why animals tend to be, when you eat meat, they tend to be more, um, uh, what's the word? Now I don't know the word. Um, they're not as tender. They're more uh, chewy. <laughs> Maybe that's the word. Uh, more gamey. Okay, tertiary structure. A tertiary structure is the final folded protein. Now, um, this is held together in a few different ways. There's covalent bonds. The example is the disulfide bridges. Those are, those are the, the cysteines um, forming those disulfide bonds. Hydrogen bonding. This is a very important way of holding molecules together or holding um, the different parts of the protein together. If you have a long protein, you can imagine its sequence kind of folds back on itself. Certain amino acids that can hydrogen bond with other amino acids, like serine and threonine, we're going to see a lot of those interactions. Salt bridges. These are where those charges come important. Those positive charges on the amino groups, those negative charges on the carboxylate groups. These guys are going to either associate with maybe metal ions um, or... Um, uh, cofactors of some kind, or they will just pair up with each other like that because opposites attract. And then hydrophobic interactions. These are really just the parts of the, um, the peptide that water doesn't like, and so it usually clumps them all together. And so hydrophobic interactions, again, become um, another of the mechanisms that hold tertiary structures together. So primary sequence or primary structure is the order of amino acids. The way that they fold into these structures, alpha helices and beta sheets, um, through hydrogen bonding, then get folded up into a tertiary structure, which um, consists of disulfide bridges, hydrogen bonding, salt bridges, and hydrophobic interactions. And here's an example kind of showing all of that. So we've got our helical structures, excuse me, our beta sheet structures. These are H bonds. Then we've got some metal ion coordination. So our, our hemoglobin molecules are another really good example of this. We have an iron at the center of our hemoglobin. Um, we actually call that a, a prosthetic group. So when you have proteins that are associated with, um, with other either metal ions or other, other, um, other uh, necessary either ligands or uh, the word that we often use is coenzyme or cofactors, um, then we can call those um, there's a special word that we call those those kinds of proteins. They're called. Sorry, I'm gonna look in the book real quick and find it. They are called conjugated proteins. Uh, conjugated proteins have prosthetic groups like the heme um, in our hemoglobin. But anyways, these metals can also be important um, with those charged groups, those um, uh, electrostatic interactions, hydrophobic interactions, disulfide bridges. Um, side chain hydrogen bonding, and then again, just regular all positive and negatives um, finding each other electrostatic in that sense. So tertiary structure is held together by all of these different forces. Now quaternary structure, this is what happens when multiple polypeptides um, associate together. Hemoglobin, for example, is actually made up of four polypeptides. We've got two what we call alpha chain, two what we call beta chain, and these associate together into a tetramer, four chains all together, and those are held together by hydrogen bonds, salt bridges, hydrophobic interactions, the same sort of things that hold together tertiary structure. It's just called quaternary structure because it's the fourth you know, level of structure, multiple, pro multiple proteins together. It's not called quaternary because there's four protein chains. That's just, so that just happens to be what happens with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has four protein chains, but that's not why it's quaternary. That's why it's a tetramer. But um, yeah, quaternary structure is the association of multiple tertiary folded proteins. Um, what's neat about fetal hemoglobin is actually, it, instead of having two beta chains, it has two gamma chains, which actually changes the affinity of oxygen uh, for oxygen for the fetal hemoglobin. It actually has a higher affinity. So when you're, you know, when you were inside your mom and your mom was breathing, your blood was actually preferentially getting the oxygen um, and not having to, you know, not having to fight your, your mom's hemoglobin for that oxygen. Uh, it's a way to ensure that the baby gets enough blood or gets enough uh, get oxygen for development. 
Um, okay, so our quaternary structures, um, they can contain conjugated, uh, or they can be conjugated proteins if they contain prosthetic groups, um, like hemoglobin. And here's hemoglobin. And here's that heme group that's associated with each of the chains. There's an iron in the center of that that binds the oxygen. Here's our quaternary structure. Here's that heme group, kind of showing you that if you remember, well, of course, you guys you guys took Chem 3A, so you, you may not have gone over coordination compounds, uh, but this is a coordination compound. Oops. Uh, many quaternary pro uh, structures, um, quaternary proteins make up some of those um, proteins that we were looking at in the last chapter, the integral membrane proteins and the, um, and the peripheral proteins. Um, so we were looking at how sometimes in your bilayer, right, if you had a lipid bilayer, kind of really roughly draw some phospholipids here, and they've got their little tails. Yeah, this was too rough, you have to use your imagination a little bit. And then let's say that we have a membrane protein here that has some little passageway, right, through the cell. If this is a folded protein, then we would imagine that all of the amino acid residues that are nonpolar are going to be in this region of the protein because that's the part that actually spans this very nonpolar part of the membrane. And anything that's sticking out on either side is going to be all the, um, the polar amino acid groups. And so when proteins fold into their quaternary structures and in their tertiary structures, uh, it's done in such a way that all the parts that need to interact together um, line up together. So all those hydrophobic parts end up in the middle. Now, um, there are a few structures that form, particularly for these membrane proteins. Um, and one of them is... Um, um, made out of alpha helices. And so you can kind of see this. This is a membrane protein called rhodopsin. And again, these alpha helices um, probably contain a lot of nonpolar amino acids because you can imagine if this is the lipid bilayer, uh, this would be outside the cell, this might be inside the cell, and this would be in the bilayer. All of this would be nonpolar. Got another example. Um, here's a beta barrel. This one's formed out of beta pleated sheets, so the other secondary structure. And again, you can imagine if this was a lipid bilayer, you've got amino acid residues out here that are going to be polar, interacting with the aqueous environment, and then all of these guys would be nonpolar, or at least the ones sticking out. If there are residues sticking inward in here, they may be polar to help facilitate, you know, whatever molecule needs to move through there. Um, but again, the way that these proteins are going to be organized, the sequence, the folding, all of that plays in to make sure that um, it can function right. And that it'll go where it needs to go, like into a membrane. The last thing we're going to talk about is denaturation. This is how we can destroy the folding of a protein. And this is done by a few different ways. One of them is heat. Um, and this is why, you know, you tend to heat up your food when you want to make sure that there's not, um, you know, bacteria on it. Or when we're cooking, right, we want to get it to a certain temperature. Heat disrupts hydrogen bonding, which will lead to unfolding of uh, proteins. Um, if we add enough heat, even, you know, exterior membranes will fall apart. We saw that the phospholipid bilayer can't even hold up to very much heat. Um, so at some point, you, you would intuitively know heat destroys everything. But um, as far as proteins are concerned, if you... If it gets too hot, your proteins start to unfold. Um, sometimes we have um, heat shock proteins, which are actually a form of chaperone protein. And the point of these is to actually go in there and help proteins stay folded. Um, so we, your body does have some sort of protective uh, measure against that, but heat will denature a protein. Uh, we can also disrupt um, hydrogen bonding by changing the pH. So adding bases or acids will go and change the charges, right, on those, um, on those R groups uh, and end up changing the hydrogen bonding. Detergents can go in here and expose the, the non-polar um, or the hydrophobic regions um, and actually cause, again, things to, fold, uh, to unfold. Uh, reducing agents, we talked about breaking disulfide bridges, disulfide bonds. 
heavy metals will actually go in there and actually displace some um, important uh, cations that are like metal ions used uh, in tertiary folding, um, or they'll go in there and form bonds or react with some of the side groups. Um, one of the examples is they can form these covalent bonds with the cysteine residues. Um, and so these, these types of bonds um, wouldn't work with the, the folding. And then alcohols also. Al alcohols usually go in and again, mess with the hydrogen bonding. Ethanol, as an example, can penetrate bacteria and actually leads to coagulation of their proteins. Um, and so alcohols, heavy metals, reducing agents, detergents, changes in pH, um, changes in heat, and also agitation, just, just stirring around, you know, or using something to stir a protein. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, an egg, beating eggs, right? Whipping eggs. You've, you've, if you've ever whipped eggs before, you're denaturing that, that albumin and you're, you're causing it to turn into a different form just for mechanical agitation. All right, so that's, uh, that's our chapter on proteins. So um, as with the other chapters, I'm going to post um, a discussion board for you guys to leave your questions. Um, when you're going through the book and, and looking at you know, what questions to, to focus on and what questions um, you want to prep for the test, um, just think about the, the different categories uh, of protein, the different things that they can be used for, the different categories of amino acids, um, the way that we write amino acids, the way that we talk about their charges, um, and the different classifications of protein in terms of their structure. Um, but again, if you have any questions,